All right, well, let's learn the Megillah. The Megillah is a book which is written by Mordechai, a Yehudi, Mordechai, and he um, <clears throat> wrote the book. We read this book every year in the holiday of Purim. The holiday of Purim is a very unusual holiday in Judaism because it is a holiday of the rabbis that the rabbis, I'm just looking something up over here, that the rabbis um, made this holiday up. And it's a, it's a very interesting holiday because it, um, it, it was the worst decree that was ever in the history of the Jewish people was on the Jews. And it came immediately after one of the best periods that were ever in the history of Judaism. The king of the world was a, a fellow called Ahasuerus. And even though he was a bit of a fool, but he was married to a Jew, Jewish lady. So we had a Jewish lady that was the queen of the whole world. And also um, Mordechai had said he was sitting in the gate of the king. And also the king made this big feast and he invited all the Jews. So the Jews were really sitting very well and they were accepted and they were um, honored. They had good positions and all of a sudden came the worst decree ever in the history of the Jews to kill all of the Jews at one time. And this is Ahasuerus ruled over the whole world. So there was nowhere to run and there was no time to run. And there was no one to run to because all everyone was against it. It was a decree to kill all the Jews. Everyone had this decree that they should kill all the Jews. And amazingly, it all turned around. And one of the reasons that the, the, the Talmud asks, why did this happen? And it says, because one of the reasons is the Jews gave up on the building of the second temple. They gave up. And they thought it wasn't going to happen. And in fact, that's what happened when Ahasuerus made this feast. He made a big feast and he invited all the Jews. And that's how this whole thing starts off. The feast was commemorating the end of the appointed time that the temple was supposed to be built or the Jews were supposed to come back. There's a prophecy in Jeremiah, in like the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, that says very clearly that Jews are going to be in exile for 70 years. And according to Ahasuerus' calculation, and he is also his wise men, which they didn't come out to be too wise. And the, the, the 70 years had finished, and that's it. The Jews weren't going to come back. The, the Jews were no temple, no this. And so he was very happy because he figured as long as the the he ruled over the whole world. And if the Jews would make their temple, it would mean that there would be sort of like this little pocket, this little area where he really wouldn't rule over. It sort of showed that God was still with the Jews. So when his 70 year period came up as, a, okay, the, the reason he made the mistake, there's a lot of different calculations to be made. When exactly to begin the 70 years and when exactly the 70 years ended? What was the sign that it would end? And in any case, a little bit of history over here, what happened. There was a king called Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, he destroyed the temple. He destroyed the temple, took all of the Jews to exile. But really, before that, uh, there was a, a king called Shalmanser, and he came and he conquered the 10 tribes, 10, ten of the tribes in the, the north, and they were idolatrous and everything. And they were warned, but they didn't listen to the warning. So they were all taken in, into prison. And in their place, as this uh, Shalmanser, he put uh, all sorts of nations that came over there. And there were some Jews that he left behind. And they eventually became what's called the Shomranim or the sometimes the Kutim. And we're going to see they, make, they, made, they made a lot of trouble. They made a lot of trouble. We'll see in a moment. Anyway, so all the Jews are taken pretty much totally into Babylon. And they're in Babylon. <clears throat> and there were different stages when the first temple was destroyed. It was like destroyed, first of all, there was a Yochanyah, King Yochanyah, and he was left behind. <clears throat> and then he decided to make a rebellion and that was quashed. And then after that came another person that said, Tio, and it, that was quashed, it was like two years later. So it's a whole question when exactly this happened. And then there was like Daniel and a couple other people that they were taken into exile before even this Yochanyah was. 
So it's a question when exactly to start it. When exactly this 70 years started counting. But the prophecy was clear by Jeremiah that it was going to be 70 years. <clears throat> the problem was, is, is, is Jeremiah right? You know, he, the, his prophecy was clear 70 years. But the question is, was it going to be, can Jeremiah be relied on? Maybe God left the Jewish people. God forbid. So Achashverosh, according to his calculations, 70 years was up, and that was it. But who is this Achashverosh? The, the world was ruled by the Babylonians, right? Well, there came up a king called Koresh, uh, right? This king called Koresh Cyrus, what it was called. And Koresh, he was from Persia. And he conquered the whole entire world. He conquered the whole entire world. And like one year after he conquered the whole entire world, he got a message from God, whatever it was. In any case, he said the Jewish people can go back and rebuild their temple. He worshipped God. He agreed with God. Jews can go back. They can go back and worship and, and build their temple. So there was, I've read different numbers, 10,000, 40,000. Anyway, a lot of Jews went up to rebuild the temple. Well, if you remember these Shomranim, these Kutim that were put there in, in the upper part of Israel. So they sort of adopted Jewish practices, and they, but they still were idolaters also. And they came and they said, we want to help. And their help was rejected. So they started making trouble. They made a lot of trouble. So the Jews, meanwhile, okay, here they are. The Jews came up from Babylon or whatever, and they came to the Holy Land. Not all of them, a large number, like I say, you know, 40,000, 10,000, they came up. But there's a lot of Jews that remain behind. And with these Jews that remain behind, and there was Mordechai, was a, a, a holy person, and he remained behind to sort of keep over them, watch over them, watch over them. So here we got all these Jews are in the land of Israel. And the these uh, Kutim, the Shomranim, are making trouble. They're not allowing the Beit HaMikdus to be built. So the whole thing is delight. And that's when the whole miracle of Purim happens. So this king, Keresh, he dies. And eventually how it comes up is, a, is this Achashverosh, <clears throat> who he wasn't a king at all. He wasn't from a royal family. He becomes the king. He, he, gets up, he gets into the position, he becomes the king. And he marries this Keresh, uh, Koresh's granddaughter, Vashti. So that gives him sort of like a justification of being, you know, a king. He's like sort of from the royal family now, even though he was just an outsider. But now he, he's a dictator and he's also a king. He took over by force and he's also a big ruler. And Koresh, he had conquered the whole world. So all of a sudden this Ahasuerus, he becomes the ruler of the whole world. Meanwhile, the Jews are having trouble in, in Israel. They won't, they won't, they're not allowed to build a temple. And they, they, the, uh, the, the Shomranim, they make all sorts of problems for them. And Achashverosh, according to his calculations, the prophecy of Jeremiah is not going to be fulfilled. And the Jews all make this, they call, he makes a big party. He invites everybody, and especially in Shushan, that's, that's the place he decided is going to be his, his capital. So it makes sense. and that's the whole that's how the whole thing starts off. So let's go. And it was in the days of Achashverosh. Who Achashverosh? This is the Achashverosh who ruled from Hodu until Kush. We'll see. Some people say Hodu and Kush, that's the opposite sides of the world. Some people say they're right next to each other. And this was if you circumvent the whole entire world. Seven, twenty, and hundred. One hundred twenty-seven countries. 1720s. There's a lot of explanations here, commentaries, but let's just do Rashi. <clears throat> Says Rashi, let's do this short. We'll do a short version, of Rashi. Okay, long one. He was the king of Persia. He was the king of Persia that he ruled in the place of Koresh. But that they saw Cyrus, they call him Koresh. This is right at the end of the 70 years of the exile of Babylon. Who Akashvirus, why does it say his name is Akashvirus? Who Akashvirus says it twice. Akashvirus, who Akashvirus? 
wicked from the beginning until the end. Hamolech, he ruled, he ruled on himself. He was not from the seed of the kings. And he ruled from Hodu until Kush. What does it mean? He ruled on 127 countries. Just like he ruled on Hodu until Kush, they're one next to each other. That's one explanation. The one explanation. You know, it's just like he ruled on two countries that are right next to each other. Also, he ruled on countries that are far away from each other. And that's what it says also, Urada, he ruled, call Avar on the other side from a place called Pesach and Tal Aza. He ruled in the whole world, you know, just like he ruled for, uh, uh, two, over two cities. He was a very successful and powerful ruler. In those days, when Achashverosh was on his throne, that was in Shushan Abira. What does it mean in those days? Let's see, Rashi says, there's huge, beautiful explanations here. Well, of course, we can't do them all. This is in. It says, He had to uh, make his rulership firm. And they say, they say in something different in the Gomorrah in Megillah. In Megillah, it says that yeah, he said, what does it say in the, in the Gomorrah in Megillah? It says like this, it says that um, <clears throat> it says, how does how would it be? It took him three years. It took him three years until his mind was settled. Why? What was the problem? He knew the Jewish people were going to come back and build the first temple, rebuild the first temple. We're going to build the second temple. And he, is, uh, he didn't know exactly when this was going to be. As soon as those three years passed, as um, he knew that there was nothing to worry about. And so he took out all the vessels. Now, now he, as soon as the three, these there was three years. As soon as these three years passed, and all the possibilities, according to his mind, passed, the Jews were not, uh, not did not return. As he took out all the vessels from the holy temple, and he made a big party. Made a big party, and that's what it says. Yeah, he was in the beginning. He was worried. That's why he was. His mind wasn't settled until three years. In the beginning, he was worried that the Jewish people would go under his rulership. Because when they finished the seven, when they finished the seventy years of their exile, but now, as soon as he saw that the Jews were still, uh, they were they were being, how do you say, harassed by these uh, shomranim by the the, Kut, the Kutim. As they weren't letting them build the temple, so now he was satisfied. He was satisfied. One minute, one minute. Uh, 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 uh. We also read Rambam. Oh yes, there's also some beautiful explanations over here that we can look at, but we can't. We don't have time to look at them all here. Let's see where is this here. No, 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 no. Why is it? Uh, I can't go. Usually you can. There we go. Ah, somehow or other I pressed the button for the Gomorrah. And this is not the Gomorrah. I don't want the Gomorrah. Well, <laughs> how did I get here? I don't know. Here we go. Huh. No. No, no, no. One second. I don't know how we, I, I must have pressed some sort of a, a button that put us, put me into the Talmud. But I don't want the Talmud. 
One second, one minute. Eh. How did I get this? I don't know. One second. Sorry. Go back up, Rabbi. Yeah, there. Exactly. There we go. No, no. How did I get into the town? I don't know. What happened? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to this confusion, but it certainly is a confusion. I, I just must have pressed the wrong button over here. So I'll go back to the beginning. Here we go. Let's go back to the beginning. Back to the drawing board. Uh, we are slaves to these machines. Here we go. Here we go. Ah, uh, excuse me. This is just so maddening. I'm sorry. I'm just going to make a pause over here for a minute. Good. On those days when Miller is king, he so Achashverosh, he made this big feast. In the third year of his rulership, Asam Mishte made a feast for all of his ministers and his servants, Chil Paras Madai, from Persia and from Madai, from Greece, and a part of these important people and the Sari Medinos and the big officials, they were all before him. Rashi, a part of him, these are the important people that were uh, ruling, made a, a a worldwide feast, which he owned the whole world anyway. So, and this is all to commemorate the fact that the temple was going to be. He showed everyone his Osher Kavod Malchuto, his glory and the the Tiferes, the splendor of his greatness. Many days. How long was this party? One half a year, six months. Shmonim Omeat Yom, one hundred and eighty day party. Yomim Rabim, he made this big meal feast for six months. He was really happy. And when these days were finished, the six month party, so he made a special party. Everyone that's found in the capital city, from the biggest until the smallest, a big party for seven days in the house of the King Rashi Gina, this is the place where he planted uh, vegetables, and Bitan, this is the place where he made his orchards. So he made this outdoor party for everybody. Malbim is also very interesting, but let's we want to make progress. Progress is important. Here we, we have there's, there's a lot. So here we have all these. <clears throat> how it's decorated. It goes into great detail. Chur, karpas, techele, techuz, bechablei putz, varagamon. Chur, these are all sorts of different types of garments that are colored. He spread them all over for these, uh, for, for coverings. Achuz, glad, they were held on by boots and argamon, by silk, uh, uh, ropes, petile, and threads of uh, strands of purple, garam purple strings and things like that. Praslam, Galila, Kesav, Al Murishesh, Mitot Zav, Kesav, there were beds of gold and silver. He put them free. And the floor was also from Bahat and Shesh, from, from um, marble. All sorts of good, beautiful stones. He had all the money in the world so he could make a stones for the floor from sapphires and rubies and everything. Everyone explains different meanings for this. There's also different Kabbalistic meanings and different Midrashic meanings and what these all imply. 
But nevertheless, it was a meal, a six-month meal you never thought before. And after that, he made a special big meal in uh, Shushan Abira. Everybody was drinking from golden vessels and different types of cups and royal wine, which was as much as the king could provide. He said, <clears throat> a, a lot, now a lot of the opinions are that he took these golden vessels from the holy temple. All the vessels were all different one from the other. A lot of rabbis say that everyone got, everyone got a wine was a little bit older than everybody else's wine. You know, of course, this is a big problem for the Jews because Jews are not supposed to drink wine that was touched by a non-Jew. And Mordecai was trying to warn everybody not to go, but they didn't listen to him. We're going to see. He promised it would be kosher food. You'll see. Hashtiakadat. He gave them according to everyone's Will and on it didn't force anybody because this is the foundation what the king um, established <clears throat> and all the 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 um, uh, waiters in his house that everybody got whatever they wanted. Every Rashi, there are sometimes there's meals where you feel a little bit shamed. You know you don't you have to drink a big cup. Some people don't want to drink, etc. But here, nobody was forced. Everybody could do whatever they wanted to. The king would say, right, make announcements. Everyone can drink, eat whatever you want. If you don't want to eat anything, you don't have to eat. <clears throat> he, all, he told all of the, the, uh, the, the waiters and the butlers that were over there to give everybody whatever they wanted. Also, Vashti, his wife, she made a big meal. Now, remember, Vashti, she's like the granddaughter of Koresh. So she's like a royalty. And Ahasuerus, he's, he's a big zero, but, the, but he, he's a king. He's very powerful. He's a great dictator. He's ruling over the whole world. So he, she's also making a, a meal. Beit Malchut in the house of, <clears throat> for the women. The women are making a special meal separate from the men. And they had a certain sense of... Modesty. On the seventh day, when the king, and this is this is the, the after party, right? This is the after party, the VIP party that everybody is going to uh, after the six month party. So, on the seventh day, when the king was uh, filled with wine, he said to Mahuman. We're going to see who Mahuman is. We're going to see Mahuman and Bizasa Harbana, Bigasa, These are the seven servants that serve the face of the king. Some people say, what does it mean, Yom Shvi? Some people say the rabbi say it was on Shabbat. This was on Shabbat when all the Jewish people now he knew. That the Jewish people were transgressing Shabbat. Now he had the chance. So he said, let's bring my wife, the queen, in front of the king and put a crown on her head and everyone can see her beauty because she was very, very attractive. Rashi says, doesn't say. It's a, there's an explanation. Anyway, the, they, the, she was commanded to come. It says that she was commanded to come and dance in front of all these men naked, which there's probably nothing that she wanted to do more <clears throat> to show off her whatever it is, as long as she you know was young in this. But the problem is that she broke out in some sort of a boils or something that day, in some sort of hives or something, and she couldn't. So he was pretty stupid, and he didn't really take any excuses. So she refused. But Temoena Malka Vashti, and her Malka, and this Queen Vashti, she refused to come in the king, <clears throat> from, the, from the king's servants, 
and the king got very angry. The Chamos of Barabo, and his anger was burning in him. Rashi, the rabbis say, because all of a sudden there came Tzorat, some sort of weird leprosy on her. In other words, she would uh, refuse, and she would, uh, and then she would get killed, because she would do the same thing. She would take Jewish girls and make them undress and do all sorts of work in her house on Shabbat, like this fire, do, do forbidden things on Shabbos. So therefore, God made a decree that she would do the same thing on Shabbat. She would be also be uh, unclothed on Shabbat. So the king got <clears throat> very angry. This is a shame, but the king, you can't even rule over your own wife. You were telling us you're the king over the whole world, and your wife is not allowed. The, the king said to his wise men that knew the times, whatever it was, they were the ones that were, that <clears throat> because that's the way that the king does in front of every everyone, that he should ask his, it says, this is the custom of the king, and every judgment that he puts it in front of, he's got all these advisors, right? So he has his advisors as the minister of the interior and the minister of the interior, the minister of debauchery and the middle of the minister of, of decadence. So he says, the people who are close to him, Karshana, Caesar, Admosha, Sarshis, Miris, Marsana, Mamukhan, the seven uh, ministers of, the, of Persia and Greece, Madai, that they saw the face of the king all the time. They were always hanging around the king. And the, so he said, what should he do? Kadad, in order to do, what should he do with Vashti? Because she didn't come. And the king of the, she didn't follow the words of Akashverosh in the hands of his servants. I mean, it was pretty stupid. He could just said, well, ask her why she's not coming. You know, do something. No, she's not coming. I don't care about any reasons. I just want to know what I should do. So the, his advisors weren't much smarter than he was. And luckily so, because it ends up that this is the reason that uh, the, the Jews are going to get saved in the end. We'll see. Mumuchan was one of his servants. Mumuchan, this is going to be Haman. Mamuchan, instead of the king and all of them, now nobody knew exactly what to do. You know, what are they supposed to do to, the, to tell her, the, the, what, to tell the king? So the king is, oh, he's blazing mad. So they can't say, calm down, king. Maybe the king will kill them also. So comes Mamuchan and he says, listen, your majesty, not just on you, of as the Vashti Amalka has done this terrible sin. To all of your ministers and all the people that are under the kingship of Achashverosh. Avta means Avon, the sin. Right? You haven't done the sin. Because when this, this word of the king comes out, that all of the women, right, when, I'm sorry, when this news of what the queen did to all of the women, then they'll all start shaming their husbands. And they'll say, Akashvero is said to bring Vashti, and she refused. You know, so, you know, I'm, I'm, if she refused the king, so I'm for sure going to refuse you. Every woman will make trouble for her husband. That's what Rashi says. As soon as there comes the word of the king, to, or the, of, of the queen, I'm sorry, to all the women that she shamed her husband, so then they'll start saying, hey, maybe this is, you know, a new women's rights thing. Let's shame our husbands. Everybody start shaming their husbands. <clears throat> so Ahasuerus, she's getting angrier and angrier. Right? This is not just a personal thing already. Today, says Mumu Khan, this, this advisor, which we're going to see, this is, this is going to be Homer. So he says, tell all of the ministers of Persia and Madai and Greece that hear what's going on, that this is enough shame, enough disgrace has occurred already to the king. Rashi, tell all of the, the ministers of the king this is what it is, what this is what, what happened, and that this is this is a shame for the king. This cannot go on. Women are not allowed to go against their husband's will. If the king, if it's good for the king, if the king agrees, 
go, let there go out a word, a command, a royal decree in front of, and it should write in the opinion, in the, uh, in, in the I'm sorry, the laws of Prasimadai, and no one can translate, can transgress this. Shalot of all because Vashti did not come from the king, therefore her kingship will be given to some other lady that's better than she is. <clears throat> therefore, what does it mean better than she is? Therefore, she should get killed. But you can't have two queens, only one queen. So therefore, and this law of the king will be heard that he's going to do with all the kingship, because the kingship is very great, and all the women will start to give honor to their husbands from the biggest until the smallest. <clears throat> Good. So in other words, now the king, you have a, a good chance to make peace in the house. This is this is the the wedding marriage counselor. Ahasuerus turned out to be one of the first marriage counselors in the whole world. He was the marriage counselor for the whole world. What's his advice? Your wife makes any trouble, kill her. And the thing was in good the eyes of the king. King said, well, why didn't I think of that? That's amazing. The Sarim, of course, all the ministers also agreed. And the king did what Mamukhan said. <clears throat> why? Because now, also when he kills Vashti, so it means that he is an unlimited king. Before, he was limited a little bit to the rules of rulership. Right, a king has to be for the benefit of the people, and etc. Whatever there was, and now he kills Vashti. All connection that he had to the previous kings, he's got a new thing now. He's going to be a dictator that's going to rule over the world, and he has no uh, limitations whatsoever. And all these ministers agreed, and and now all with means what that the the power from the ministers is all taken away, and he has the power to do whatever he wants. The, 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 who invite who advised him to this? This Mamukhan. Mamukhan is the minister that advised him. And it's like I said, that was that was Haman. So he sent letters to all the countries, every single country, as it is written in their own language, and in their own writing and in their own language, that everyone should be a master in his house. And <clears throat> It was written in the language of each and every person, Rashi. Kofa Atisto, every person could force his wife to learn the language of her husband, if it's a different language. In other words, no longer will men speak the language of the women. There's no mama lushan, mother tongue. Forget mother tongue. Now it's all father tongue. Your mother speaks a different language than your husband. She must speak, learn his language. No more speaking ladies language and the right language okay first chapter second chapter let's see if we can get to this here we go one minute one minute oh, no how do I change one second we'll, f we'll figure out how to do this Oh, maybe that. Oh, here we go. Yep. No, 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 no. Oh, here we go. After this happened, Kashokh, the calm down Hamas and Melech, 
and they calm down the anger of King Achishverosh, Zacharat Vashti Vetasher Asata. She remembered Vashti and what happened. Betasher Nixaralem, what he, how he killed her, right? And also how beautiful she was. And now he got sad, the king got sad. But we're talking about a pretty crass person over here. Vayomer, and he said, Vayomer, Nari Melch Meshartav, and the young men, the servants of the king said, Yevakshul Melch Narot Betulo, look, the king should look around for young virgin girls that are beautiful. Huh? What's wrong with that, Your Majesty? You, you, you benefited. Before, you had to be only married to one woman, and now you got all the women you want. Right, of the, the whole kingdom is yours. Remember, you're the king. The king said, "Well, I tell you, you know what? <laughs> you guys are right. The king made a decree, and he sent messengers calling me down to Melchoso and all of the kingship. The Yikvatsu was calling Nara, and he gathered every woman, Betula Tova, that was a virgin, that looked good, to Shoshana Bira, to the house of the women, to prepare herself. She was given over to Hege Saris on Melech." to the eunuch, Hege, the, the, the eunuch of the king, and he was the one that watched over the women, the Natun Tamru Kehen, and he gave their, whatever is their um, uh, makeup. It says, because everybody, that's why he sent special messengers so they could go on and pick out beautiful women. These are the women the, 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 and, and he brought them so that they would go on to this beauty treatment preparation. You'll see what this is. <clears throat> also, it's a, a good smelling oils and spices and ornaments and ointments and things. And this will make her flesh look nice. I mean, this is the, the Akashvi, which is a pretty low life type of a person. But what do you want? <clears throat> and the woman, the, the, the girl, that will be good in the eyes of the king, she will be a queen under Vashti. Huh? Beauty, beauty, beauty contest. This was the advice that these young <coughs> advisors of the king said. And he said it was good. Payas can, and he did it. He, he, he did this. Here it says that the Bamalbim. He says that the <clears throat> here the king didn't ask anybody advice because already he's got the power to do whatever he wants to. So from now on, he doesn't take advice from anybody. He just relies on himself. Now it starts a whole new thing. Ishud. Ishud, and this is we're going to stop over here. Ishud. Now we are introduced to. Mordechai. We already have the king Achashverosh. We already are introduced to all the bad guys. Achashverosh and his wife Vashti. She was evil. She used to torture the girl. She got killed. And Haman, Umuchan, he gave this advice. And the, the young, the Nare Amelech, the young advisors of the king said, why don't you just, you know, try every girl in the, in the, in the kingdom. You got 127 kingdoms. There's a lot of girls, you know, you can try try everybody until find you, you find yourself a nice wife. Okay, enough, enough of that. Disgusting topic. <clears throat> What's this all leading up to? Ish Yehudi. There was a Jewish man. Now this happens to be the first time that the word Yehudi is used in Hebrew literature to refer to all the Jewish people. Mordechai was Yehudi, also means from the tribe of Judah, Yehuda, but he was not from the tribe of Yehuda. He was tri was from the tribe of uh, Benjamin. So we'll see. Ish Yehudi, Mordechai. Ish Yehudi, so it says, why was he Yehudi? Because he denied idolatry. Ish Yehudi. Because <clears throat> he said, because he Here he says, why was he called Yehudi? Because he was together with the exile of Yehuda after 
Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. So everyone that was taken, they were all called Yehudim. That's what he said. They were all called, even if he'd come from another tribe. It says, Ishimini, he was really from the tribe of Benyamin. It was from the tribe of King Saul, from Benyamin. Okay. Uh, and his name was Mordechai. Mordechai, and his name, from the, he was the son of Yair, who was the son of Shimi, who was the son of Kish. Ishimini. He was, Ishimini means he was from the tribe of Benjamin, Yamini. Another opinion says that he was called Yehudi because he denied idolatry. It says anyone who's called idolatry, everyone else was bowing down to Haman. He had a little statue around his neck. We'll see that tomorrow. And Mordechai was the only one that did not. So it was Ish Yehudi, and his name was Mordechai. We'll go back to this God willing tomorrow. And that he was exiled from Jerusalem with the exile that was uh, with Yehonia. Now Yehonia, he was a king that was exiled like 11 years before the temple was destroyed. Melech Yehuda, that Nebuchadnezzar uh, exiled all of these people before the temple was destroyed. Let's see if everybody says no, Rashi doesn't mention it. And he took care of this girl that was called Hadassah. Who is Hadassah? Esther. Now, Hadassah also means like a hyssop. And it says that Esther was really green. She was really not very beautiful at all. But for some reason, this is exactly what um, Akashverosh wanted. She was Bat Dodo. She was the, well, we'll talk about what, what she was. In any case, she was his cousin. He ain't law of him. She didn't have a mother and father. And mother and now you have Some opinions say, well, we'll see, you have She was very beautiful. You have a store with Tova Mara, and she was very pleasing. But when her father and mother died, look at how Mordechai, Mordechai took her Labat as a daughter. Some people say, don't say bought, but for buy it. He married her. That Mordechai married, says Rabbateno Perisha, Labayat, Leisha. That Mordechai married Esther. So Mordechai and Esther were actually married. And we'll stop with this. Remember, tomorrow we'll continue. Uh, chapter 2, sentence 7. Have a good day, everyone, with Mashiach now. Tomorrow, 8.15 in the morning, God willing, we'll learn Hasidut.